Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. We have a great pleasure and privilege now to have with us uh, Professor Sir Leszek Borysiewicz, the ex-Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge and the uh, newly elected uh, uh, Dr. Honoris Causa of our Jagiellonian University here in Krakow. It's a real pr pleasure and honor uh, to host you. Your first and last name clearly indicate that you're of Polish origin. What's the story behind it? The story is my parents were... Um, uh, my father was one of ten siblings. That He was born on a, a, a small farm, a peasant farm in Dombrówki, which is a little um, hamlet uh, just outside Wasilkow in Podlesia. Uh, seventh son um, joined the army, captured by the Russians in 1939, um, out in uh, Siberia with uh, so many others. My mother's family were in Grodno, uh, which is again, they were interned in Lithuania, then captured um, uh, when Russia invaded Lithuania in 1940. Uh, both end up in Siberia. Oddly enough, after a long, sorry, my father meets my mother in the train taking them to Kazakhstan to join the Anders army and then like so many of my generation in Britain all came from that Middle East transit through Iran, Iraq, Palestine, Egypt and then fighting at Monte Cassino and then ending up in Britain largely because they felt they couldn't go back to a Poland which was uh, already coming under communist rule uh, from uh, Russia and their fear of Russia of course was based on their experiences um, in the Soviet camps uh, in the, the 1940s. We were lucky to that they found a job in the immediate post-war period um, and more importantly in the areas of Britain in the West which were heavily bombed during the war they could find accommodation and then my father built a house for us in uh, Cardiff while he was taught himself bricklaying um, and he continued as a bricklayer uh, for the rest of his life um, and we grew up in a small Polish community which meant I spoke Polish till the age of five. Um, which you still do. Which was um, the right thing to, d to do because my grandmother said the Red Army will be marching down Whitehall anyway in five years' time, so you may as well, r Polish and Russian will d do you better than English. Fortunately, so she was wrong on that. <laughs> thank goodness, yes, she was. But uh, she lived to be 99, and uh, it, was, uh, it, it was quite a privilege to, to do that. And of course, being here this week has been quite remarkable for me because we have just celebrated my father's 100th birthday. So I feel doubly privileged at my age to still have a chance to be able to discuss things with my father and to learn yet more about his upbringing and Poland. And therefore, the relationship to Poland matters to me, even though I feel very much Welsh and British, uh, first and foremost, but r deeply respect Poland as the, 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 the place where my parents came from and a, a tremendous sense of loyalty and a great desire to see Britain and Poland continuing to be close uh, together, despite what might be looming in the near future. Hopefully not. There's still some chances that it won't happen. How did it all start with science for you? That's an interesting question, because when I was a teenager, I never wanted to do science. The first subject, my first love, was actually archaeology. That's what I wanted to study. But it was very clear that um, as my sister also wanted to go to university and my father was a bricklayer, there was no way two of us could go to university uh, unless there was something at the end of it. And he was very open with me that this was the situation. But I also quite enjoyed biology and then decided to, to, to go into medicine. So it was a kind of default thing to do. And it took about four weeks of being in university. As a child, I always had this awful view of always asking the question, why, 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 of every teacher in school. And most of the time, the answer was, you don't need to worry about that because it's not in the examination 
uh, course, so don't worry about it. And I started asking the same question in the four weeks at um, university. And I remember our first lesson was in embryology uh, about the, m the movement of cells in the early poles of the embryo. And the question that I asked was, are these cells migrating or are they dividing? And the lecturer did not disabuse me in the way the teachers would, but said, you know what, we don't know. And that's suddenly you began to realize that there is a world of don't know that is so exciting. And after about four or five weeks in university, I decided, yes, I wanted to do medicine, but whatever medicine I would be doing, I would revert back to laboratory-based research as part and parcel of my career in the future. And it was that question of, we don't know, but my goodness, wouldn't it be exciting to find out that there's always been a driver. But in the meantime, before you actually had the leisure of coming back to research, you had to specialise, and that was, as I'm aware, quite a convoluted way. Yes, it, it was uh, difficult for me because I could never make up my mind what was the most interesting area. As you study medicine, and I think it's still the same for so many students of medicine today, every subject you encounter is fascinating in its own way. So I went through a process of the very first uh, work that my exposure was with orthopedic surgery, so I thought it was great to repair bones and limbs. Um, then I realized that was more like being a carpenter than being a surgeon. So I don't need to be derogatory to our orthopedic colleagues, but they're often referred to as that in Britain. Um, the next area was one of, based on research I was doing as a student, was in obstetrics because of respiratory distress syndrome, so I wanted to do that. Then I wanted to do surgery, um, decided that it was rather dull holding a retractor uh, in theatre for too long, um, and then I moved to, to do um, periods in, in endocrinology, nephrology, neurology, and eventually ended up doing nephrology, and gave that up quite late on in the day when I was already a specialist in kidney disorders to, um, I got bored with it and went and did infectious diseases. Why I'm sad is that process of going through a lot of disciplines is not one that is open to young medics today. They have to decide sometimes too early as to where they want to specialize. Um, I still think that looking around and sampling so many different disciplines gives you a wider perspective than merely a narrow, siloed view um, that is expected of, of young doctors today. So what actually was it that brought the would-be orthopaedic surgeon to inventing a vaccine against the papillomavirus? So firstly, um, what happened was the, my interest was stirred very much in when I was doing nephrology. Um, one of the wards I had to look after were wards of patients of, with renal transplants. And in those days of renal transplantation back in 1979-80, we were hitting uh, renal transplant patients with enormous doses of steroids, I mean 60 milligrams of prednisolone daily. Uh, in order to prevent rejection. Um, the consequences were that many developed cytomegalovirus infection and we found that we lost a large number of patients through CMV and there was a question, why was this happening? And that got me very interested in human persistent viruses. Um, what changed was that we carry about 20 or 30 of these viruses with us for the whole of our lives. And what you gradually learn is the miracle is not that occasionally somebody will fall ill with cytomegalovirus as a result of immunosuppression. The miracle is why any of us are alive at all. And papillomavirus was one of these viruses, but was always very difficult to work with because you cannot culture human papillomavirus in vitro. So you really could not study it until molecular technology came along. And my interest in the vaccine and 
this is something that a lot of people will mistake, were not the preventative vaccine that's in use today. That was mostly the work of colleagues in Australia and at the National Cancer Institute, and it was a brilliant set of studies. My interest was what could you actually use the immune system in those very early days as an immunotherapy to clear virus where the infection was already established. What we know is that the current vaccine that girls get and boys in many countries are starting to get is it prevents you getting infected in the first place. But once you have an infection, there is, it doesn't do anything to clear it because there are other mechanisms, mostly cellular immune mechanisms, that clear that infection. And my interest was, how do you clear those? So the vaccine studies I was involved in were therapeutic vaccines rather than preventative vaccines. And it's a common mistake. So we were starting to work on therapeutic vaccines or in today's world, immunotherapy, back in the 1990s, in the very early days, uh, um, as an approach. So. That's how I got there. Um, it was mostly, again, the biology that was the interest of why are we alive. Yeah, that's true. And hence your seminal paper in The Lancet in the 90s, right? Was it 95, 96? Yeah, 95, 96. And why this paper was and still is quoted is this was the first time an onc gene, a known gene that produces change, uh, E6 and E7 of the uh, papilloma virus was allowed to be introduced into patients artificially in a vaccinia vector. Uh, so it's an unusual vaccine because there were there's a lot of debate as to whether it of itself could actually incorporate into normal cells and therefore cause cutaneous cancer at the site of injection. That was a, a risk that was being uh, considered at the time. So it was quite revolutionary to use that. And we began to get the first indications that such an approach could actually work in uh, papillomavirus. There are groups now around the world that have followed that up. And as we've understood immunology better over the last 20 years, I've learned two things. Firstly, it was a miracle we even saw a signal out of the crudity of the studies we were doing in the 90s. And secondly, how important it is to understand the basic mechanisms of immunology if you're ever going to refine proper vaccines into the future. And all that uh, very strongly underpinned, so to speak, with uh, the philosophy that you're, that you're holding to, that is of uh, scientific freedom and the, and the tradition of the university of which you spoke so uh, brilliantly during your uh, speech uh, during the, uh, the ceremony yesterday. Why are these so important today? Well, I think they are more important today than almost at any time in history. Ancient universities like Cambridge and the Aguilonian University here in Krakow have survived for centuries because of their capacity to adapt. That's straight evolutionary theory. If you don't adapt, natural selection will eliminate you. So they adapt. They're organisms that will adapt to whatever difficulty circumstances will pose. And I know only too well how difficult life has been for the Aguilonian University over the centuries. The second issue is they're built on a fundamental principle, and that's this principle of academic freedom, that they will enable students and staff to focus on topics that are of real interest to them and allow them the time and space to make critical discoveries. And it is not enough for those discoveries to be only of economic value because much of the work in the humanities and the arts, which is so essential to making our lives better, will not have economic value, but they have huge societal value. And the brilliance of ancient universities like Cambridge and the Aguilonian University is that they've been able to make sure that that freedom is preserved despite whatever circumstances uh, exist. 
At the moment, throughout Europe and throughout much of the world, universities are under intense pressure to de deliver economic benefit as well as a well-educated student body. My argument is you will get the best if you give people time and place to make brilliant innovations. You don't rush them uh, too quickly. Yes, you have to make, uh, uh, econom take economic benefit where it occurs from discoveries, but don't feel that everything has got to be geared to economic wealth. It is just as important to keep fundamental disciplines going in, uh, throughout the centuries because, quite frankly, none of us know where the next big breakthrough uh, may be coming. For the full seven-year term, you were the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, which, uh, taken that the Chancellor is uh, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, was the full rectorial function. How is it to run an institution which is one of the pinnacles of civilization? Well, it's lovely of you to say that uh, we are. I would say exactly the same here about the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. It is such an important institution. All universities are important cultural institutions wherever they are in regions of countries or elsewhere. Universities are expected to be so many things to so many different people. Just think for a moment, what is demanded of a, by society of a university today? Well, first and foremost, a wonderful place of education for undergraduates. But we're also expected to produce postgraduates. We're expected to produce specialists in fields from engineering to... Um, we're expected to produce great composers and artists and people who can actually enrich our lives in so many different ways. We're expected to be repositories of knowledge. We're expected to be data centers where we actually accumulate uh, information. We're expected to be able to interpret that information, make wholesale new discoveries. Um, and at the end of the day, we're expected to be fully accountable uh, uh, to uh, whichever authority is actually granting us income. So we're expected to be a large number of things. The magical thing about universities is you'd think all of that was impossible. But universities actually do it, and do it all. And therefore the risks to universities are external risks where a demand is placed on just one of those functions to the exclusion of all of the others. And I'm a great believer that maintaining autonomy of universities is something that enriches society and allows society to place the trust that universities depend on in those universities in a world which can change in an instant with uh, social networks and uh, social media today. So to me, that principle is absolutely essential. And to be in a position where, if you are at a University of Cambridge, to be able to fight for that and for people to take notice is a fantastic privilege to be given. And that's why I enjoyed my time at Cambridge immensely. Um, and will continue to uh, support the importance of autonomy of universities and the capacity of us to deliver yet more for society because there's so much more that universities can do. Well, thank you so very much for, for this interview, for coming here, for accepting our doctorate and for the support of, of uh, Polish academic life and, and the collaboration between the United Kingdom and Poland, uh, if only in this area. But this is not the only area, of course. But, of course, I would also want to thank the Jagiellonian University for the immense honour of being uh, a awarded an honoris causa uh, doctorate at the university. I know how important it is because the granting of an, uh, uh, an honorary degree is something that is uh, the highest honour that a university can bestow. And I'm deeply uh, uh, touched and honoured by th this award and commit myself to working very closely with now colleagues, dare I say, at the Jagiellonian University to see if we can ensure that as much interaction and collaboration can occur into the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so very much. <laughs>